Hi everybody, welcome back to Super Awesome Calculus. So today, we're going to go over the first chapter in James Stewart's book, which is entitled Functions and Models. I call this section Functions, which is pretty nerdy, but whatever. Anyway, today we're going to look at functions because functions are basically the principal object that we'll be working with in calculus. So it's very, very important that you have a solid understanding of what functions are. Now I'm going to assume that you've had some exposure to functions via pre-calculus and whatnot, but if you haven't, well I'm sure you can find out some interesting things on the internet about functions. They're pretty easy to understand and maybe you even might get a decent understanding through this. So a function specifically is a rule that will assign any element of a set D to exactly one element of a set E. So let me, let me make this a little bit clearer. We have two sets here. This is set D and this is set E. And we're going to write some numbers. In set D, let's, I'm just picking numbers here. Let's pick numbers 2, 5, 7. Okay? Now in set E, let's pick three more numbers. 1, 2, 1. Now, what this means is that any number here, let's call this x, all of the things in D are x and all the things in E are y, that x, 2 would go to 1, 5 could go to this 1, 7 could go to this 2. These are all things that would be legal in a function. But one thing that can't happen is that 2 can't go to both 1 and 2. That wouldn't work, and that would make this not a function. So that's basically what a function is. But you know, you've dealt with functions before. You're probably familiar with seeing functions in algebraic form. Uh, one example would be 2x squared minus 6x plus 3 equals 10. I just made that up. That's probably a disgusting looking function. Yeah, it's not very pretty, but basically that's a function. It's an equation, which we can use as a function, because what we do is we choose y, y, or f of x, and we relate that to x. So, if you've got 3x squared minus 4 equals f of x, we have a function. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at four different ways that you can represent a function. Now, there are four very basic ways. The first is verbally. The second is through uh, numerically, through a table of values. The third is visually, by a graph. And the fourth is algebraically, by an explicit formula. Okay? So those, like I pointed out, the algebraic equation that I wrote up there is somehow related to the functions that we're going to be covering in this course. That being said, what we really want to do here is we want to understand how to create a function. Now, in math, uh, math has a lot of applications in life, but the most frequent application is, hey, Bob, or hey, Jill, you know, we have this problem, this is what's going on, can you solve it? And that basically is a verbal representation of a function. And you, as a mathematician, or whatever your job is, you could take all of that data and create something out of it. I'll give you an example. We're going to do an example right now that's going to combine all four different representations of a function right now. All right, Augie, that's me. Augie makes sandwiches. I don't actually make sandwiches. They're disgusting. I, I'm terrible at making them. I like eating them. Bad at making them. On day one, Augie makes one sandwich. On day two, he makes four. Day three, 
he makes 9. On day 4, 16. How many will he make on day 5? Now, I included a little bit of a question here, how many he will make on day five, but we don't really need to worry about that yet. Let's look at the function as it's written verbally. Augie makes sandwiches. On day one, he makes one sandwich. On day two, he makes four. On day three, he makes nine. On day four, he makes 16. Now, we can understand this as a function because we have one day he makes one sandwich. So we've got column D is the, is the number day, and column E, or uh, set E, is the amount of sandwiches. So what we can do now that we have it written verbally is we can write a table of values. Remember how we made those sets earlier? That's kind of like what we're going to be doing right here. We make a table of values. So table. We have Table A, day, table B, sandwich. So day one, day two, day three, day four. All right, now table B, on day one, we made one sandwich. On day two, we made four sandwiches. On day three, we made nine sandwiches. On day four, we made 16 sandwiches. Okay, so this is a numerical representation of that same function that we wrote up there. So now, now that we have this, we're going to look at a way to visualize this. We've got the numbers, we went from the words to the numbers. Now let's see what this function really looks like. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to graph it. Now you've probably worked with graphs before. They're not hard to work with. In fact, they're very, very convenient and we'll be using them a great deal in this course. You don't need a graphing calculator. Um, I know at a lot of schools you can't actually use a graphing calculator or any calculator in calculus. So don't worry about that. Now, here's a graph. I'm just going to focus on the first quadrant positive quadrant. You've got the y-axis and the x-axis. This should look familiar to you. You got zero right here. Now in the x, if you remember, we had the first table. We have the days. This right here, days, independent. Now we look at the y variable. What's the thing that's going to be fluctuating? Well, that's going to be the sandwiches. So we have day one, day two, three, four. Now let's go ahead and put five there. Now we got one. Let's call this. Uh, we want to get the right shape here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so number one. Day one, we made one sandwich. We'll plot points. Day two, we made four sandwiches. Day three, we made nine sandwiches. And day four, we made 16 sandwiches. Or I made 16 sandwiches, apparently. So now what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line through all of these, and we're going to look at this. you can see the way that this line is moving. You can see it's parabolic, which you may remember. A parabola is something that looks like that, kind of a U-shaped thing. You probably looked at that a great deal in uh, pre-calculus. So this is a parabolic type graph. And if we followed this line for day five, well, I'll tell you, we'd end up somewhere up here at 25. So, what we're going to do now is we can look at this, and because we know the shape of the graph, we can create an algebraic representation of this function. 
So this function, which was really just me saying how many sandwiches I made every day, we can write this function very, very easily. If we made one on the first day, four on the second day, we can see that we made the amount of sandwiches times the amount of days. So day three, we made three times day three. Day four, we made four times day four. And of course, numerically, that is the number squared. So sandwiches equals the day squared. Or algebraically, we would write f of x equals x squared, or y equals x squared. And that is how you can represent a function in four different ways. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about symmetry. Just give me one second. fix that later. Symmetry is a very important concept in calculus as well. I'm going to cover this basically as simply as I can. In symmetry you have even functions and you have odd functions. Let's look at a graph. This is an easy way to understand it. A graph. If we have a parabola like this in quadrant run, one, and we can flip it around the y-axis, we have an even function. Now, specifically, an even function is, let me make sure I give you the precise definition, f of negative x equals f of x. And we can see this in, for instance, f equals, or f of x squared, which is an even function, by the way. f of x squared, is, let's take 1, negative 1 squared is 1, negative 2 squared is 2, so we're going to get the same value regardless, and that's what makes that an even function. Now we're going to get back to the original example in quadrant 1 in a second. Now an odd function is, let's, let's use the example x cubed. That's a good example. x cubed, as you may remember, something kind of like that, kind of like that. So we look at x cubed, and we can see that in quadrant 1 and quadrant 3, what's represented here is just flipped around the line y equals x. It's just kind of flipped around it. And the way that this, uh, the way that you demonstrate this is f of, x, f of negative x equals negative f of x. And once again, you can use f of x equals x cubed, and you can plug in the numbers, and you can find that that is indeed the case. So that is, uh, that's how you can find an even function or an odd function. We'll talk a little bit more about that as certain examples come up. I got to work on that. Now, one thing we're going to talk about is piecewise functions. Piecewise functions are very important. Now, actually, when I said about the function that we created, that it was really f of x equals x squared, I kind of lied to you. I kind of lied to you. Because if you remember, we were only talking about function what, uh, positive here. We didn't focus anything on the left side in quadrant number two. We didn't focus on anything there. What the function really is, is f of x equals x squared if x is greater than zero. f of x is zero if x is less than zero. Uh, let's call it greater than or equal to zero for x squared. So basically what that's saying 
is that there are no negative days in the function we described earlier about the sandwiches. You can't have negative day two. On negative day two, I didn't make four sandwiches. So you have to account for the fact that there won't be anything prior to the starting point. This is a piecewise function right here. Now, as you can see, a piecewise function would look uh, of the kind that I just described would have an interesting shape. It would look kind of like this. That's, that's one type of piecewise function. Another piecewise function that you may be familiar with, there are two that we'll talk about very briefly here. There's the step function. You've probably seen that. Uh, a step function, of course, is uh, x is a or, uh, f of x is a certain value until x gets to a different number. So that's a, that's a step function. The other function that we'll look at that is very important, and we'll look at this several times in the course. I keep dropping everything. The other function that we're going to look at is the absolute value function. Ching. Oh, that's that's not very good. That was supposed to be right down in the center of the axis. You can see the absolute value function. It's basically the line y equals x and the line y equals negative x. And it's, it's exactly that. The absolute value function is absolute value of x. That's how we write absolute value. Equals x if x is greater than or equal to 0, and negative x if x is less than 0. So those are piecewise functions. That's a function that is going to be one thing. It's going to be one type of function if there's a certain set of variables, like for if x is greater than 0. If we're talking about 1, 2, or 3, then we're going to be talking, we're going to be using the top part of the piecewise function. If we're looking at a lower number, a negative number, we're going to be using the bottom half of the function. So that's a piecewise function. Now, finally, we're going to look at vertical line test. We're going to look at the vertical line test. And we're going to also briefly talk about increasing and decreasing functions, very briefly. Kind of a lot going on in this first chapter. So the vertical line test is pretty simple. Let me draw a function right here, right now. Here's a function. We're going to use that. Not all functions need to be pretty. You can see that one has kind of camel humps in it. That's, that's a perfectly fine function. Now the vertical line test is a good way to tell whether or not something is a function. Uh, for instance, here we go. If the vertical line, you can draw a vertical line anywhere on the graph, and if the vertical line only crosses the function one time, it's okay. Notice this is the uh, x-axis that's not part of the function, but this line, this vertical line, crosses only once. Draw it here. Only crosses once, right there. You can draw it here. Only crosses once, right there. Where else do you want to draw one? There? Okay, cool. Draw it there. Only crosses once. So I think you get the idea. This is a function because the vertical line, I can draw one anywhere on the graph, and it's only ever going to cross the function, or the, the output, one time. So, how does it fail? Well, the most basic one that we're going to look at is the circle. I'm about to embarrass myself by drawing a circle. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Anyway, there's a circle, and if you can, you can see, let's draw a vertical line. Not good. Not good. Draw one there. Not good. We can draw one here, a tangent line to the circle that touches it at only one point. 
that does exist. That's going to be very important later. But if we look at this circle, we can see that by the conventional sense that we're describing a function right now, that on the x, y coordinate plane, I need to preface that, you'll see why in chapter 9 or 10, I think 10, that a circle is not a function by that definition. So, that is the vertical line test. I'm getting a phone call, but I'm going to ignore it. Um, the last thing we have to look at is we have to look at increasing and decreasing functions. A function is increasing. Well, let, let me draw examples of both. This isn't hard to see. Here we go. Ah, this marker It's letting me down. Okay, we got two coordinates. Here is an increasing function. Here, yeah, there is a decreasing function. It's pretty obvious what they are. An increasing function, increasing, decreasing. This will be very important when we talk about derivatives in chapters 3 and 4. Increasing function is very simply f of x1 is less than f of x2. Okay? A decreasing function is the exact opposite. f of x1 is greater than f of x2. In other words, as you move from a lower number to a higher number, from left to right along the graph, the, fun, the output values, the y values, should be getting higher and higher and higher. If they're doing that, then the function is increasing. If they are getting lower and lower and lower, then the function is decreasing. Very easy, pretty easy to understand. All of this seems rather elementary at first, but as you'll see later on in the course, these things are going to be, these types of functions are going to be analyzed in different ways ways that are going to be a lot more rigorous and we're going to really understand what's going on with these functions. Now, every lecture I'm going to leave you with the big problem. Now the big problem is a question from Stewart's book that I, uh, for those of you who missed the first lecture, Calculus Early Transcendental 6 Edition by James Stewart, not the movie star, uh, we are going to work on an exercise. So I'm going to assign you a question and then at the very beginning of the next lecture I will answer the question. So here is today's question. A spherical balloon with radius r inches has the volume v of r equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. Find a function that represents the amount of air required to inflate the balloon from radius r inches to a radius of r plus 1 inches. Now, before you go, I want to give you a very quick hint on problem solving 101. You probably know this, but this is, I didn't know this until, I, I always struggled with word problems. We're going to do a lot of word problems in this course because I think that's the best way to present a lot of materials. The first thing you need to understand with any word problem is that you can't answer a question you don't understand. So look at what that question is asking you. You're not looking to find a number. You're not trying to find a number. You're trying to find a function. If the original function is v of r equals 4 thirds pi r cubed, what is a function that would increase it from r to r plus 1? So your answer isn't going to be a number. It's going to be a function. So with that, Good luck, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.